Hello, this is Matthew from Illinois, and you're listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. This episode is about climate change. I think it's the number one issue facing us as humans and the number one issue we should take to the ballot box. Hi, everyone. This is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics. And in our first of what's going to be several episodes on climate change, I am talking to Nathaniel Stinnett, who is the founder and executive director of the Environmental Voter Project. Hello, Nathaniel. Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, thank you for joining me. So uh, let's start with what is the Environmental Voter Project? So we are a unique environmental organization in that we never actually talk about the environment. All we are focused on is finding people who care about climate change or other environmental issues, yet they're not voting, and then we try to turn them into better voters. So we like to say that we're in the behavior change business, not the mind change business. We have never tried to persuade a single person to care more about climate change or the environment. Instead, we're trying to make sure that everybody who already cares about those issues shows up to vote in every single election, local, state, and federal. Excellent. And we'll dig more into what that means. But could you give me a little bit of background? You know, where do you come from? And, uh, you know, how, how did this get started? Absolutely. So I live in Boston, Massachusetts. And prior to starting the Environmental Voter Project, I spent over a decade running political campaigns, big and small, either as a senior strategist or a campaign manager. And I was always frustrated by one thing in particular, and it might be something that you're familiar with, Kelly, and that's this. When you poll voters to ask them about the issues they care about, climate change and the environment are always way, way down their list of priorities. And that always really frustrated me because no matter what candidate you're talking about or what candidate you're working for, whether they're a good environmentalist or not, they're not going to be able to spend their time and political capital talking about issues that voters don't care about. They just can't do it. And even when my candidates won, it was really hard for very good reasons to get them to spend all their political capital talking about climate change and the environment, because voters don't deeply care about those issues. But what led me to starting the Environmental Voter Project was a really interesting discovery, and that's this. Even though voters don't tend to prioritize environmental issues, it turns out that there are a whole lot of non-voters who do. In fact, our research shows that there are almost 20 million already registered to vote Americans who care so deeply about climate change and the environment that they list it as one of their top two priorities. The problem is those people don't show up in polls of likely voters because they're not voting. And so that led us to start the Environmental Voter Project. We realized, you know what? There are lots of great groups who talk to voters or talk to drop-off voters and make sure that they, they vote for the right person. But no one's going after the truly awful voters who already care about climate change and the environment, but they're not yet showing up. And so that's what we do. And we think it's, we think it's the low-hanging fruit of the climate movement because we don't need to persuade anybody of anything. We don't need to change anybody's mind. We just need to tweak their behavior, and that's a lot easier. Why do you think that is, that there are a lot of people who are care deeply about the environment but aren't voting? Is this something that can be explained at all by demographics or geography, or do you have any sort of sense of why that might be? That's a great question, and we have some answers to it, but only some answers. Uh, there are some things we just haven't been able to figure out. So first, I'll go over the stuff that we do know. Some of it is tied to demographics. Regardless of whatever stereotypes 
you or, or any of your listeners might have in their heads, it's important to understand that people who care about climate change are no longer white yuppies wearing Patagonia fleeces hopping out of their hybrid vehicles. Maybe that was the case 10 or 15 years ago, but it's not now. Now, the people who are most likely to care deeply about climate change are African Americans, Latinos, people who make less than $50,000 a year, and people who are under 35 years old. Now, it's a much more complex picture than that, but you've probably realized that all of the demographic groups I just mentioned tend to vote less often than the average American. So that's one thing that's going on there. Another thing that's going on is all of those demographic groups that I just mentioned tend to have legal barriers thrown up in front of them to keep them from voting. But here's the really interesting thing, and this gets into what we don't know. When you look at just young people, the environmentalists vote less often than the other young people. Or if you vote, if you look just at Latinos or just at African Americans, the environmental Latinos vote less often than the other Latinos. And so even though there are some demographic correlations at play here, that's not the whole answer. There's still something going on that makes environmentalists vote less often than other people. And what we think is happening here, although we don't know, is that those people are saying, politicians don't care about me, so why should I vote? And you know what? <laughs> They're right. They're right. Why on earth would a politician care about you if you don't vote? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And whether you vote or not is public record. And so, yes, if you don't vote, of course politicians will ignore you and ignore the issues you care about. And so that's what we're trying to change at the Environmental Voter Project. We are a full-time field campaign that is laser-focused on just one thing, and that's finding these non-voting environmentalists and turning them into consistent super voters. Because voters drive policy, not non-voters. And so how do you do that? What is your approach to getting the people who are not voting to vote more frequently? It's essentially just two steps. The first step is we use a lot of the data that's attached to public voter files to build large predictive models to identify these voters. And that sounds really complicated, what I just said, but we essentially use the same tools that say, life insurance companies do to build actuarial tables. So we'll poll tens of thousands of people in a state, and we'll ask them some very simple questions like, what's your number one most important political priority? What's your number two most important political priority? And then we'll isolate those people who say that they really care about climate change. And we'll look at the voter file and see, oh, what are some interesting data points that these people have in common? And can we build a model that helps us find other people like them in that state? And it's an iterative process that goes on for a long time, and we work with a lot of data scientists. But this allows us to, to model an entire state voter file and identify all of the individuals who have a really high likelihood of listing climate change as their number one or number two priority. And we test and retest these models, and they're frighteningly accurate. So that's the first step. We find these people who deeply care about climate change and the environment. The second step is we isolate the ones who are bad voters. You don't need to be a data scientist to do that. All that data is right there on the voter file. And then we try to change their behavior. And here's the really interesting thing, Kelly. The Environmental Voter Project never talks about the environment. And the reason is this, it, it, it's not a very good way to get environmentalists to vote. Hmm. Now remember, we, we already know that these people are with us. We already know that we're preaching to the choir. They deeply care about climate and the environment. And so we wouldn't talk about chocolate chip cookies if it got them to vote. We can afford to be completely message agnostic. We just want to get the bus out the door on election day. And what we've realized is that the best messaging to you to change people's behavior is to use peer pressure and social pressure. And so we essentially 
like revert back to fourth grade and say really juvenile things in our in our mail pieces and our text messages. We say things like, hey, Kelly, did you know last time there was a midterm election, 37 people on your block of Main Street turned out to vote? Just little things like that. We'll compare your voting records to your neighbor's voting records. We'll text you and simply say, turnout's going to be really high in precinct seven, wherever you live, things like that. We're, we're just using very simple peer pressure and social pressure, but it works. We're social animals. And when we think that we're not adhering to a societal norm, when we think that all of our peers are doing something, we want to do it too. So we, we take advantage of that. And then can you measure the results of what you're doing and see what that looks like if turnout increased among those groups? Yes, we can. And this is where what is otherwise a pretty a pretty unsexy data science-y uh, approach to politics actually becomes very exciting. We can measure our results with real scientific rigor. And here's how. Before we talk to any of these non-voting environmentalists, we submit our work to what's called a randomized control trial. And that's kind of like the, the gold standard for behavioral science experiments. And what it essentially is, is let's say we've identified a million environmentalists in Florida who we think are unlikely to show up to vote. Before talking to a single one of them, we randomly remove about 200,000 of them and set them aside in a control group. And we never talk to those people. Then we turn to the remaining 800,000 and we call them our treatment group. Those are the people we call, we canvas, we text, we send them digital ads, we send them direct mail. Then the election happens. And unfortunately, while everybody else is clinking champagne, we, we still don't know how we did. <laughs> but, but a few months after election day, voter files are updated, and we're able to see who voted and who didn't vote. And at that moment in time, something really special happens, because then... We can see how many people voted in our treatment group and how many people voted in our control group that we didn't talk to. And we can show with real scientific rigor how much we at the Environmental Voter Project were solely responsible for increasing turnout. And we're already getting some of our results in from the 2018 midterm elections. And in Georgia and Colorado, we increased turnout among the environmentalists we were targeting, 2.2%. And I know to some people, 2.2% might not seem like a lot, but ask Hillary Clinton how big a deal 2.2% <laughs> is, right? I mean, that's, yeah. it's everything in this business. These are really, really big results. So you've mentioned things like mail pieces and texting. Do you also do in-person voter contact? We do. So we do a lot of door-to-door -door canvassing. The only issue is that's obviously a very hard thing to scale up. Mm -hmm. So we have over 2,000 volunteers across the country at the Environmental Voter Project. And what's great is that if you live in Idaho or Iowa and you're one of our volunteers, we can train you up over the phone or over webinar, and you can text and call the environmentalists we've identified in Florida or Georgia. But you can't canvas them. <laughs> if you live in Iowa, you can't canvas someone in Georgia or Florida right, unless you take an expensive plane trip down there. So we do have canvassers, and they probably knocked on close to 70,000 doors this past cycle. But it's a lot harder to scale up our door-to-door -door canvassing operation because you don't just need a lot of volunteers. You need a lot of volunteers in the right places. So which states are you currently focusing on? We are currently in six states. We're in Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Massachusetts, Nevada, and Pennsylvania. And the reason we're in those six states, Kelly, is we've identified enormous numbers of non-voting and seldom voting environmentalists in those states. And that's an important criteria for us, because if we go into a state and just kill it every time there's an election, 
we're still not going to have an impact on policymaking in that state unless there are, unless we have lots of targets, right? Like we need to have a target rich environment. We need to have a big denominator in order to start really changing policymaking at every level. And so we're in those six states, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Massachusetts, Nevada, and Pennsylvania, because they are super target rich. There are tons of non-voting and seldom voting environmentalists there. And I want to be clear about something. Our goal with the Environmental Voter Project is not to be some secret election winning strategy. Believe me, talking to bad voters is not an efficient way to win one election. <laughs> Anybody can tell you that. <laughs> Rather, what we're trying to do is we're trying to change the electorate. We go into these states and we view with every election even if it's for dog catcher or library trustee or city council, we view every election as an opportunity to change people's voting habits. And so we'll go into a Georgia and we'll be active for five, six, sometimes even seven elections a year. We think every election is an opportunity to build up more robust voting histories for people so that after two, three, four years in a particular state, we can talk to people close to 20 times and dramatically change the number of environmentalists who are in those states. So that's where we're currently operating. We certainly looking ahead, uh, hope to expand our operations and we have some ideas about that. But that's that's our current base of operations. And what would it take to expand? Is this a matter of being able to get increased funding? What What would be sort of the criteria you would use about whether you would then go on to expand? Yes, it has to do with it with with increased funding. So we are a nonprofit. We get all of our funding from donors. What we do is fairly cheap just because turnout is much cheaper than persuasion. Changing people's behavior is cheaper than changing their minds. But before we talk to a single voter in a state, we have to rent access to a voter file. We have to poll over 10,000 people and work with data scientists to build these models that help us identify who the environmentalists are. And so we usually spend 50 grand in a state before even talking to a single voter. And then once we start talking to voters, we want to make sure we can do it well. We need to pay for mail pieces and organize volunteers and send text messages and things like that. But when we look at our expansion opportunities. We're, we're really excited about it. First off, when we launched three years ago, we crowdfunded $350,000 and we ran a year long proof of concept and got amazing results. Then in 2017, we ended up raising about $475,000 and expanded into five new states. And then last year in 2018, we raised 1.5 million. And so we're really growing quickly and we're excited about our growth potential. And when we look forward to what we're gonna be doing in 2019 and 2020, our hope is that we'll be able to expand into Virginia or Arizona or both of them. We're not gonna expand into all 50 states. We're not even gonna expand into 20 or 30 states at once. It's just, I, I feel like that's not responsible growth. We want to go into a state and hit a home run, not go into a whole bunch of states and hit singles. But the reason we like Virginia and Arizona is there are enormous numbers of non-voting environmentalists in those states, and they also have very active election calendars over the next two years. And that's important because the only way to turn a non-voter into a voter is to have an election. And so we, we want to go into a state that are going to have have lots of elections. So it obviously all of the elections matter, and there are lots and lots of positions from you know municipal elections on up that could have a real impact on the environment. Do you think that the work you're doing will or could potentially also affect something as big as the 2020 presidential election? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I say that for two reasons. One, some of the results that we are getting on an election by election basis are certainly adding a larger number of environmentalists to the electorate 
than the margin of victory in a lot of states during the last presidential election. Now, I can't tell you who our people vote for. I don't know that. No one knows that. The Clinton campaign didn't know who the people they were turning out voted for. Neither did the Trump campaign. That's secret. No one knows who their people vote for. But we're turning out people who care so deeply about climate change and the environment that they listed as their number one or number two priority. And we're turning them out in such large enough numbers and we're having such a big impact that, yeah, it could absolutely be the, the difference maker in particular states in 2020. But more importantly than that, I'd suggest to you, Kelly, that our work in 2019 is even more likely to have an impact on 2020. And here's why. And this is such an important thing. And if, if your listeners only remember one thing from this interview, let it be this. Who you vote for is secret. But whether you vote or not is public record. It's public record. And if I'm the campaign manager of someone who's running for president in 2020, the first thing I do is I look at the public voter file and I see who voted and who didn't vote. Because I'm trying to build a universe of people that my campaign is going to communicate with. And if you, Kelly, are a registered voter who has never, ever, ever showed up for a presidential primary before, there's no way in hell I'm going to waste my money talking to you. And it's an important realization for all of us to have, this, this realization that politicians go where the votes are. They look at public voter files, they see who's likely to vote, and those are the people they communicate with. So how does that relate to our work at the Environmental Voter Project? Well, we're going to be spending 2019 getting to all of these non-voting and seldom voting environmentalists. And we're going to get them to vote for mayoral elections and state legislative elections and statewide judicial races and all of these relatively quiet, down-ballot elections. But what's really interesting is if we can get some of them to vote, it only takes two months for the record of them having voted in those sleepy elections to show up on the voter file. And then, then it's like there's a bright red beacon next to their name saying, hey, look at me. I even vote in these sleepy countywide ballot measure elections. So you damn well better believe that I'm going to vote in a 2020 presidential primary. It's like we're pushing these people into the pipeline. And once we get them to vote, they become first-class citizens, and then everybody who's running for president falls over themselves trying to appeal to them. So, yes, we think we can have an impact in 2020, but if we want to hit a grand slam in 2020, we need to load the bases in 2019. We need to get all these environmentalists into the habit of voting and create a public record showing the campaigns, hey, you need to talk to these people. You need to pull them to figure out what issues they care about and you need to appeal to them. And the only way to do that is to get them in the habit of voting. What are some of the ways that our listeners can help your project? Well, the first thing that they can do is go to our website, environmentalvoter.org, and sign up for free election reminders. If you go to our website, environmentalvoter.org, and sign our voter pledge, we will send you free reminders before every single election you have, even if it's for dog catcher or library trustee. And some of your listeners might think, oh, you know, I vote in every election, but it, people rarely vote in every single election. And it's so important because of what I just said. Your voting record shows politicians that they should care about your opinion. Surprise, surprise, politicians don't poll non-voters. They only poll voters, and they only make policy based on the opinions of voters. So if people sign up for our voting reminders, we will send them an email, and if you give us our, your cell phone number, we'll send you text messages prior to every single election where you live. So that's one thing you can do. The second thing people can do is also on our website, environmentalvoter.org, they can sign up to volunteer. And what we'll do is it's a really easy process. 
If you sign up to volunteer, you'll immediately get a link to sign up for a training webinar. And we can train you to call or text or canvas environmentalists across the country. And this is going to be so important in 2019. I mean, just this spring, we're looking at four really important mayoral elections. We have Jacksonville, Florida, Tampa, Florida, Las Vegas, Nevada, and Denver, Colorado. Those are four really big cities in really important states that have mayoral elections in March and April. And we already have volunteers texting and calling and canvassing those voters. And no matter where you live, whether it's in Topeka or Tallahassee, we can train you up and you can help us mobilize these environmentalists to vote. And the more of them we get to vote this year, the more likely those people are to show up next year and really drive policy around climate change and the environment. Do you think that, you know, there's a lot of news right now, maybe I'm just paying more attention now, but it seems like climate change has really been in the news a lot in the, the last couple of weeks, couple of months. Do you think that that's something that is, is going to sort of drive change uh, in the electorate uh, in moving forward in the next couple of years? Yeah, something, something is definitely happening. There's no doubt about it, and, and we know this from even from some of the exit polling data that we saw coming out of the midterms. So first, let me give you some, some background. If you go back to 2014 in those midterm elections, polls of likely voters showed that 2% of voters listed climate change or the environment as their top priority. If you fast forward to the 2016 presidential election, it was the same number. 2% of actual voters listed climate change or other environmental issues as their top priority. But then, if you look at exit polling from the 2018 midterms, 7% of actual voters listed it as their number one priority. Now, 7% might not seem like a lot to you, but that obviously represents a dramatic shift over just the last two years. And we had 118 million people vote in 2018. So 7% of 118 million means there were over 8 million voters showing up at the polls, caring more about climate change than anything else. I mean, that, that's more than the entire membership of the National Rifle Association. Eight million environment first voters is a big, big deal. Now, whether that green wave will continue growing or not over the next two years, I don't know. And certainly a lot of the press coverage that you referenced, I think, helps matters. But the environmental movement is starting to get politicized and it's starting to come into its own. And we're starting to express ourselves not just by riding our bikes or changing our eating habits, but also by voting. And if we can continue this growth, we can be a really, really powerful player in 2019 and 2020. And God knows that's important because I'm, I'm a hopeful, optimistic person. But as, as I'm sure you know, Kelly, and as I'm sure your listeners know, just a few months ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that humanity has 12 years left to take dramatic action to avert climate catastrophe. And 12 years ain't a lot of time, but we need to realize something really important. All we need to address the climate crisis is political leadership. That's all we need. We already have all the scientific solutions to this problem, all the technological solutions, all the policy solutions. All we need is political leadership. And that's both good and bad news. The good news is, wow, okay, we already have all the solutions. We just need to enact them. The bad news is, as you know, because you're in the business of talking about politics and being an activist, not every year offers the same opportunities for change in politics. And over the next 12 years, we will only have three presidential elections. Each class of U.S. senators will only be up for election twice. And we're only going to have one round of redistricting. And that's right after 2020. And so 
I would make the argument, Kelly, that 2020 will be the defining moment of the climate crisis. It will be the most important moment of the climate crisis. It will be the most important year that any of us live through if we want to address climate change, because the the people who are elected in 2020 will have a decision-making power and authority to create new legislative districts and pass new laws that we're not going to see again over the next 12 years. And so if we've only got 12 years left to act and political will is the only missing ingredient, well, then the climate movement has to hit a grand slam in 2020 because it's our last best chance. I'm not sure if that makes me hopeful or scared. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm with you. There are days when I wake up hopeful and there are days when I wake up scared. But let me put it this way. One, one way to put a, a truly hopeful and I, I, I believe honest spin on it is this. All we need to do is vote. I mean, some people might view this as cynical, but I, I, I just think it's clear eyed. I mean, Politicians go where the votes are. They go where the votes are. That's just a simple arithmetic of how elections work. Either you go where the votes are or you don't get to be a politician anymore. And so the really good news for the environmental movement is that we have this silent green majority out there. And yeah, it's really frustrating that so many environmentalists aren't voting. But boy, is that a solvable problem. I mean, that's an eminently solvable problem. If we show up, there is literally nothing that can stop us. If we show up to vote, not only will we impact who gets elected, but regardless of who wins the elections, they're going to have to appeal to the issues we care about. Because nothing, nothing motivates a politician more than the prospect of winning or losing an election. I mean, just imagine something, Kelly. Imagine that you and I woke up tomorrow morning and we looked at the front page of the New York Times and it said in big, bold letters, likely voters list climate change as their number three priority in the upcoming presidential election. I suggest to you that if, if that happened, the whole world would change overnight. The whole world would change overnight and we wouldn't have elected a single person. Because politicians go where the votes are. If people who deeply care about climate and the environment start showing up to vote, politicians will follow or they will lose their job. And so that's the good news. The good news is that the climate crisis is not some disease for which we have no cure. Like we know what the cure is. We need the political will to pass these laws and enact these solutions. And there are enough environmental voters out there that politicians will do whatever we want if we just start showing up. Is there anything else that you want to make sure we talk about? I guess it's, it, I want to just stress to people that it is enormously empowering to know, to understand that whether you vote or not is public record. My guess is that a lot of your listeners didn't realize that whether they vote or not is public information. And maybe some of them even feel a little squeamish about it now that they're, <laughs> they're hearing it. But my guess is you also have a lot of listeners who, maybe not publicly, but in the privacy of their own home, will say, oh, you know, I live in a district that always votes Democrat or always votes Republican. My vote doesn't matter. And boy, that couldn't be further from the truth, Kelly. Their vote matters more than they could possibly imagine. In fact, I would suggest to them their vote is the only thing that matters. Because the first thing any political campaign does is they look at public voter files and they decide, okay, who are we going to talk to and who are we not going to talk to? And they only talk to the good voters. And they only poll the good voters to figure out what issues they care about. And so if you want to be a first-class citizen, if you want to drive policymaking, then you've got to vote. Hell, even if you write your dog's name in on the ballot, you still need to vote. Because simply by voting, you become a first-class citizen. And I would also suggest 
that when it comes to climate change, yes, federal lawmaking and federal policymaking is important, but so is state policymaking and local policymaking. I mean, big city mayors could save the planet. They could save the planet with little tweaks to zoning codes and building codes and parking regulations. And so it's really important that people who care about climate change start showing up in every single election because voters drive policy and non-voters get ignored. And my hope is that your listeners will view that as a really empowering message in the face of what is often a really paralyzing problem. When a lot of people think about the climate crisis, they're, they're paralyzed by fear. They think, oh my God, like, what, can, what can just one person do in the face of such a large problem? And the good news is, the good news is we have such craven politicians in this country that they will do anything to win an election. And so if we all vote, if we start showing up, they will immediately see that in public voter files and respond. And that's a really easy, impactful thing that all of us can do in 2019 and 2020 to impact the climate crisis. We can vote. Vote for city council. Vote for mayor. Vote for library trustees. Vote, vote, vote. Because that's your, that's your ticket of entry into the very small group of people in the United States that actually drives policymaking. All right. I love it. Well, Nathaniel, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. This is really fascinating work that you're doing. And we'll put a link up to your website up on our website as well. And I hope people will will check it out. Well, thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for the work that you do, whether it's addressing climate change or a whole host of other issues. We're, we're only going to achieve these things by putting the time and effort into the type of work that you're doing. And this, this podcast is a, a true gem. Like, thank you for doing it. Thank you for creating so much activism through your work. Well, thank you. And listeners should stay tuned throughout the month of January and probably into February. We're going to do several more episodes on climate change. I think it's the issue of, of the moment that we need to be thinking about. And so I hope you'll tune in. Thanks for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? Off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri. And we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wethlin and was created for use by this podcast.